everyone. Welcome to New Hampshire Housing presentation of From the Outskirts to Downtown, Taxes, Land Use, and Value Analysis of Seacoast Communities. I'm Sarah Reitzman. I'm the Executive Director of the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast and the Housing Coordinator for the Regional Economic Development Center, REDC. This event is presented by New Hampshire Housing, which is a self-sustaining corporation created under New Hampshire statute with a mission to promote, finance, and support affordable housing and related services for the people of New Hampshire. Part of what housing professionals do is to think creatively about policy alternatives that will help to promote housing development and housing affordability, also recognizing that while everyone needs a place to live, the creation of new homes is an essential part of the Granite State's economic development future. We recognize that Urban 3's approach could have great utility in many communities throughout New Hampshire as communities wrestle with questions of how to promote what forms of land use through their zoning ordinances to achieve the best outcomes. The Urban 3 study analyzed 15 communities across the Granite State, large and small from the seacoast to the North Country. Joe Minicosi will present the results of his work in the seacoast communities of Dover, Exeter, Portsmouth, and Rochester tonight. This presentation is being recorded and we'll share links to the video and presentation with registrants tomorrow so you'll be able to watch it. Joe's presentation will last about an hour, then we'll have time for Q&A. Enter your questions in the chat box as we go and we'll get to as many of them as we can tonight. So before I introduce Joe, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, uh, Craig Deachman and Associates, RBC, Capital Markets and TD Bank. We're very grateful for their support. I'd also like to tell you, take a moment to tell you a little bit about the Workforce Housing Coalition and the other host events tonight. So the Workforce Housing Coalition is a nonprofit that works across the greater Seacoast region of New Hampshire to educate and engage communities and municipalities to advance diverse housing options. We do this by providing technical assistance and education, community engagement and local coalition building and messaging. Our vision is that members of the workforce can put down roots, creating a more diverse and equitable community that benefits us all. Learn more about the Workforce Housing Coalition, join our mailing list at seacoastwhc.org, and you can follow us on social media. Our handle is at seacoastwhc. I'd also like to thank tonight's co-hosts that helped to promote the event. The event. Uh, this is our second time or third time maybe working with Portsmouth Smart Growth hosting an event together. So Portsmouth Smart Growth is an organization that supports and inspires a vibrant community. To that end, they have brought in luminary speakers such as Jeff Speck, the authors of Walkable Cities, Chuck Marone, creator of Strong Towns, Mike Lydon of Streets, Street Plans and Brett Todarian of Urban Works to lend their insights and lead conversations about making the Portsmouth area more livable and resilient. Portsmouth Smart Growth events like this one are always free and open to the public. To learn more, watch videos of previous events, or join their mailing list, visit PortsmouthSmartGrowth.org. We're also pleased to be hosting with Plan New Hampshire tonight. Plan New Hampshire has a vision of healthy and vibrant communities, very similar to Portsmouth Smart Growth, across the state and works through the lens of the built environment to get there. They serve communities of all sizes and the planners, designers, and builders who shape them. Plan New Hampshire is most well known for its community design charrette program, but Plan also administers the Municipal Technical Assistance Grant Program, or MTAG, for New Hampshire's incorporated cities and towns who want to expand options for places to live. You can learn more about Plan NH online at plannh.org. And a big thank you to the 15 communities who are part of Urban 3's analysis this year, especially, of course, the Seacoast communities, Dover, Exeter, Portsmouth, and Rochester. And now, before I turn it over to our speaker, I'll tell you a little bit about Joe Minicosi. He is the principal of Urban 3. Prior to creating Urban 3, he served as the executive director for the Asheville Downtown Association. Joe is an urban planner, imagining new ways to think about and visualize land use, urban design, and economics. Joe founded Urban 3 to explain and visualize market dynamics created by tax and land use policies. Joe holds a Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Miami and a Master's of Architecture and Urban Design from Harvard University. In 2017, Joe was recognized as one of the 100 most influential urbanists of all time. Joe, welcome virtually to the Seacoast of New Hampshire. They're all yours. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
my mic's on. You can hear me now. Um, let's get back to the show. <clears throat> so thank you all. Thanks for um, thanks for having us, and thanks for asking us to do this study. This was a lot of fun. Um, it's not often you get to do an analysis of an entire state, um, so that was pretty cool. And um, for some of you, I know that this is going to be a repeat. I know that you were at the main presentation, the, 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 the main presentation. So I'll go through some of the some of the stuff will be a repeat. But a lot of this stuff will drill into detail for the Seacoast communities, as I mentioned uh, in the last show. But first, if you'll allow me to just go through the, uh, the the intro of how we look at things. And the lesson that I always give every community is to see yourself as having a form of DNA. So the smallest village will grow to be a place. Um, Portsmouth started as a village before it grew into a city. Um, and it's, there's like a DNA or a pattern, and you see it more in New England towns than you see, um, let's say, in the Sun Belt, uh, because of that heritage and history. And the simplest way I think of it is that we all understand DNA. We understand, like, this is how I started my life when I was three months old, and this is my path. Um, I'm going to be my grandfather whether I like it or not, or more importantly, again, when I had hair, um, this is these are my parents. So I'm genetically Italian. There's not a lot I can do to change that. You can see that in my name or how much I wave my hands around when I talk. Um, it's just who I am. But we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease in my family. And being Italian and having heart disease is kind of a conflict because I eat a lot. Um, so I have to do things to exercise, choose what I eat. I don't eat as much pizza, um, you know, things like that. That these are choices that I make now to deal with consequences in the future. So in any community, what we're going to show what's great about this study is it is a representative sample of a lot of different places. And you can see that genetic material in each of the communities. So this is the metaphor that I'm using. I'm just putting that up front uh, as a lesson. If you could walk away with this presentation with, with one idea, it's just what is your town or village or city and who do you want to be when you grow up? And whose heart attacks are you avoiding? So uh, speaking of place, I currently live in Asheville. And a lot of the work that we do uh, was kind of honed here in Asheville. Uh, Asheville is a spectacular place, but it always hasn't been spectacular. It actually fell flat on its face after the Depression um, and basically laid fallow for close to 50 years. We we're essentially too poor to tear buildings down, even though at one point we were the second largest city in North Carolina. Um, and there was this attitude in Asheville. That's a, that's a 1996 Chevy celebrity, by the way, um, that, that we're not urban. Uh, we're rural mountain people, you know, we're not from Atlanta, we're not from Boston, we're, we're, we're rural. Um, and anytime somebody tried to fix these buildings, they were met with resistance. Now, there's a lot of people that changed that. It was actually the city that took the lead, um, and a lot of investors followed suit. Uh, one of the investors I ended up working for his company, uh, Julian Price in the upper left, and Julian inherited um, a good deal of money, and he put $15 million into a for-profit real estate development corporation. Our job was to use that fund as a investment portfolio to invest in buildings and businesses. 75% of the money went into business uh, buildings and 25% went into the businesses to help start them up. But simply put, we would find buildings like this and convert them into apartments and uh, for the upper stories. Now these are four to 500 square foot apartments. And it's funny when I talk to audiences and I'm like, who would live in a four to 500 square foot apartment? And I ask for a show of hands, I usually get like, two or three hands, maybe five out of 100. And then I change the question and say, okay, in this room, who has lived in their lifetime in a four to 500 square foot apartment? And 90% of the hands go up. And it's funny that that's a simple market analysis, right? Rather than say, what do I want right now? What do I need for in my, my lifestyle? Let's think about the fact that we're a city of 90,000 people and surely there's 28 people would want to live in a small apartment. They're, they're either recently divorced, new to town, recently graduated, maybe they just want to live in a small space on Main Street, whatever. It's, cities are all about a diverse housing choice, and this has been 99% leased up ever since. And, and the lesson for me in Asheville is that we find that, that communities are talking about um, biases or belief systems and not on data. We, we, we rarely start the conversation with data. So, so here's downtown Asheville's value. So we're a $15 million investor in a $100 million portfolio. So if you look at, coldly look at our city as a real estate investment, our downtown was worth $100 million. 
And just by fixing up those vacant buildings, we grew to 500 million, 550 million. We didn't get a new building in downtown until 2008. Now to show you that it wasn't all love and roses, the city primed the pump by doing some streetscape projects, basically cleaning up the public realm so that investors would come in and add value to the buildings to measure it with the public realm. That people that live in an urban environment want to have a, a well-invested public realm. Um, these are actual campaign ads from the from the 1990s from Chris Peterson, who's a friend of mine. Uh, but Chris thought all of this investment downtown was a boondoggle. Uh, Chris is in, is very conservative, but he also uh, doesn't see the need for public investment in streetscape projects and parking garages. And $26 million is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to anyone. I don't have $26 million, but let's just ask you a question. If you invest $26 million into a $100 million asset and that value grows to 500, is investing 26 and growing $430 million, is that a good return on investment? Of course. And what I find is that we just don't do a simple analysis like this and just make it an unbiased question of is it worth the investment, yes or no? Are we measuring this stuff? And you're not going to stop Chris. Chris has a website with fire and brimstone. Um, he misspelled charlatans over here. Um, this is our mayor, by the way. And I asked the mayor, I like that she's being hit with a lightning bolt. I, I said to her, I said, Esther, uh, is that a liquor drink? And she goes, yeah, it should be. You know, you're just not going to stop Chris. He's entitled to his opinion. He's not entitled to facts. So this is about putting the facts forward and realizing what a city is. And the city, to me, is just a finite boundary of land. Actually, our state has made it illegal for Asheville to annex land. So those acres are all the acres that we've got. That's it. We essentially have a state-mandated growth boundary. Um, now, if we're a real estate corporation, what's my city? And if you just look up the word incorporate, it says to constitute a company a city or other organization is a legal corporation. So by law, cities are just basically really big real estate development corporations, not just your city. Your county is incorporated. Your state is incorporated. Our country is incorporated. Joe Biden said this in 2016 on the Stephen Colbert show, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. And I'm such a nerd. I'm seriously not making this up. I looked it up as soon as he said that. I was like, oh my God, I can't. It's like it's midnight. This is on the bottom of the slide. That's the US code that lists us as a federal corporation. Go ahead and look it up. So, so my city at $14 billion of taxable value is six times the value of Ted Turner. So do we behave that way? Does my does my city council make a decision based on a, a salient review of, of the data and numbers about what's going on in the community? No. But they should, you know, it's, would you expect Ted Turner to make all of his decisions based on what people say, say on Facebook? Of course not. But he's going to pay attention to the information on Facebook. So it's all about a place for where your information is, but also understanding what, what your commodity is, which is land, and what you have to grow, which are crops or buildings. So this is one of the buildings that we rehabbed, uh, ground story retail, second floor office, and upper stories residential. So, so thank you, City, for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. This is this is what Chris got all upset about, and he called it a subsidy. It's like what what is it, thirty thousand dollars worth of street furniture in front of our front door. So fine, even though the entire world can work on it, let's just call it a subsidy. We took the taxable value for this property from three hundred thousand dollars to eleven million dollars. So the tax value grew by three thousand five hundred percent, or a, another way of putting it. The taxes we all get in our community just shot up 3,500% on, on an asset in our community. So do we have a 401k plan that grows by that much? This is how we stimulate community wealth is by, and on top of that, this, this building has been there for 100 years. So it's produced this wealth for 100 years in our portfolio. We just had to polish it. And some people look at it and go, well, Joe, that's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. And it's like, okay, fair enough. That's double the value about but it took 34 acres to make that value, right? So, so it consumed so much more of our farm to give us that yield, and we're doing it on 0.2 acres. So it's really not fair to look at real estate on a per acre or on a, on a total value basis. On a per acre basis, you can see things apples to apples. So per acre, these are our taxes that we pay per acre versus their taxes. So that's 100 times more taxes, um, double the retail sales per acre, who would have thought that a furniture store, a tattoo shop, and a beauty salon was that productive? But they are. I mean, again, just be agnostic. Look at the numbers. Uh, we've got residential. They don't. We've also got a lot more jobs. 
So again, pound for pound, dollar for dollar, what do you want? I and mean, some people look at this and they're like, you, you know, Joe, you just, you just hate Walmart. And, and if you're thinking that, you're missing the point. Um, in fact, I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference. Um, I've done it a couple of times. Uh, it makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man. It's pretty much the squarest conference I've been to. The super awesome people though, very, very rigorous about data. This guy got up and he was the keynote presenter uh, from Walmart, that he was their director of property tax. And he did this amazing presentation on how cheap Walmarts are. I'm in the back of the room watching this go down and I'm like, this is awesome, that's, that's efficient. One meeting, he's getting all of his property taxes lowered with one meeting. 3,000 assessors in the room. Now assessors are agnostic. If it's a low valued building, it's a low valued building. They were very thankful that he's sharing the information on his cut sheets on what his costs are. So I was trained as an architect, I'm having a coronary. I'm like, how is this guy getting away with this? Um, so I went up to the microphone and I asked him, I'm not making this up. I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful, useful life of one of your buildings? And he honestly shot back 15, 20 years. We designed the building to depreciate as fast as possible. And then we'll go and build another building to depreciate it down again. The buildings are throwaway as far as we're concerned. We're not in that for the long haul. From the mouth of babes, right? So if this is their investment strategy and you're a hundred million, multi-billion dollar real estate portfolio, shouldn't you be operating at that same level of, of intellect to understand your economics? They're doing it. So don't hate the player, hate the game. And if this is a choice that you want in your community, make sure you do the math. So their commitment to you is 15 to 20 years, which is, use, which is the useful life of a cat. Sorry to all the cat owners, I'm a dog owner, I'm, I'm a dog fan, um, but I'm making a joke here to drive home a point. These are all terms of investment that happen in your corporation and you should make these conscious choices, but you should definitely do the math on this stuff. And this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. This is fifth grade division. We're already doing this when we talk about cars, right? When we talk about cars, we don't say, what's the miles per tank? You know, I drive a Ford F-150, 650 miles per tank. You'd laugh at me, you'd say, Joe, that's, that's silly. It's got the biggest tank. That's not, that's not efficient. Efficiency is miles per gallon. And oh, look at that, the numbers just changed and we should all be driving BMW Assettas. Sorry to you Prius owners, but a, a 1955 Assetta is more efficient. That's how we understand efficiency. If we're doing this for a, a $3 commodity, shouldn't we be doing this for a $30,000 commodity? Um, but by the way, this, this car is really dangerous. If, if you have a head on on that thing, you're, you're stuck in it. But um, anyway, this we've done this all across the country. When you mash the numbers up, you see a pattern. Uh, for every dollar of county taxes, somebody in an unincorporated county is paying to the county. Their brother in the city is paying about five times that to the same county. Here's the Walmart. There's the mall. This is a two-story building, a three-story building, and a six-story building. So for many of for many of the communities in New Hampshire, you're not going to see a six-story building, but you may see a two- or three-story building. So this is about building wealth. This is this is the same in Driggs, Idaho is Durham, North Carolina, is Dallas. When you see these, when you stack stories, you're stacking your dollar bills. So if we can look at data and see what's going on in your brain, and I can show you your creative thought process in green versus your brainstem activity in blue. Uh, can we do the same with data to see your economic MRI of your community? Can we make an economic model of place? Uh, this is Hennepin County, home to Minneapolis in, in Minnesota. Can you tell me where downtown Minneapolis might be? This is this is the potency inside the model. So so back to how that's work. This works. Let's go back to Asheville for a second. This is my county, uh, 350 square miles. I have a big park right here. This is Mount Mitchell. This is Mount Pisgah State Park or Federal Parks, part of the Blue Ridge Parkway. And just to be just to be crude about it, you know those parks don't give me money. It's like all right, fine. You know they don't they don't pay taxes. So we just gray them out on the on the histogram up here. Low value in green. High value in purple. This purple splotch right here, this big one, that's worth $100 million. That's the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house. Um, the house is worth $100 million. Very valuable. But it's really not a fair way of looking at it because the, the, the lot that that's sitting on is 8,000 acres in a, and it's also got a 180,000 square foot house. Anybody have a 180,000 square foot house? Of course not. There's only one in the country. That's it. So it's it's, it's going to have a lot of value just by its sheer size. But per acre, this is how the map looks. So this 
same data, different question, different results in the information. I'll just show it to you in 3D. So can you tell me where downtown Asheville might possibly be? And you can see downtown Asheville popping off the map right here. We can see our little cousin of Black Mountain, which is about 12,000 people. We can see it's downtown. Now, part of the reason why we produce this map is because we don't have the greatest relationship with our county. Um, even though I'm a county taxpayer, I've got two people out in the county for every one person inside Asheville. Uh, they got our state legislature to call us a cesspool of sin, which was like super awesome. But you know, in their in their defense, they don't know what we produce for the county. So if we're all county taxpayers, and this is a, a economic model of how the county is getting property taxes from a productivity standpoint, shouldn't they be thanking us for all the revenue that we generate? You know, this there are people that live out here in Fairview that think they pay a lot of taxes. They have no idea what we're what we're paying in downtown to the county. So show it to them, and it's all just basically spatial analysis. Um, by the way, I know this joke only works for people over the age of 35, but I still like to use it. It is spatial analysis. So back to you all. Um, I want to thank the state for allowing us to do a statewide model. Um, we, had, we had already done uh, Manchester, um, and anytime we go to a community, we have to figure out your tax system um, and the quirks that are in each different. Every state's got different tax systems, but it all kind of yields the same results. Um, North Carolina is really simple. It's called a straight line, simple system. It's one of the simplest that we've ever experienced, but it's basically, you get a market value, the state sets a taxable reduction to get your tax value. Locally, you set up your tax rate, and boom, that's your tax bill. For you all, you've got a lot more exemptions than we do, um, and then generally speaking, you're dividing your, uh, you take, you're basically using your budget to set your rate um, off your city's valuation. Um, and that's, it's not that complex. We've, we've seen some crazier stuff. Um, but in, in the case of Dover, the, uh, the Dover tax rate's about two mils. Um, your county tax rates are, are pretty, uh, pretty low. Um, so this is, this is what your city tax would produce on $600,000 worth of value for commercial and residential. Um, your county rates a lot lower at 0.13 mils, which it would produce $780. So, so you see the tremendous difference, 14,000 to the city and only about $780 to the county. Um, if you go to Southern states, you'll typically find that that's reversed, that people pay more to the county than they pay to the city. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why we sprawl so bad is that the county gets all of this extra revenue out of the cities. But I guess that's a personal problem with us here. So back to you all um, in your state, this is a total value map of your of your uh, the way your data comes in. Um, so the large parcels come in super hot. This is value per acre. And then you start to see how there's a lot of gravity um, along the coast and down here toward Nashua and Manchester um, and, and Concord um, here. There, there are some black spots that you see, like somebody hit your state with a shotgun. Um, and those are missing, missing data files. Um, not, it's not extraordinary uh, that, that you have that situation. Those areas tend to be really rural. They're still paying taxes, but for the most part, the data is kept on a spreadsheet and, and it's not necessarily, it isn't needed to be in the GIS system. Um, and as your state, uh, as, as time goes on, those will eventually become digitized. But for right now, those are, there's, there's black pock marks in your state. Uh, don't be alarmed by that, that's not a big deal. Um, but basically, here's your state in 3D and you can see uh, basically where all, the, where all the towns are, and then here are the ones that we focused on for the study. But for this talk today, we're going to be focusing on the seacoast, um, uh, Rochester, Dover, Portsmouth, and Exeter. Um, but just while we're talking about the state, you're averaging about 22% uh, non-taxable statewide. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll come back to that in the future. It's a good benchmark for all of your municipalities um, in how you operate. So these are the different zones of how we've clustered uh, the, the family of, 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 of communities, um, and, uh, and these are the cities that are within the peer sample. We'll come back to these, uh, but basically you will have all of this data and you can compare yourself, and in fact, we would encourage it to, to check yourself against other peer cities um, that, that may not even be in the seacoast, but uh, you all obviously have a different locational advantage uh, to the Boston corridor, but also to the, to the, uh, to the ocean. Um, so here you are. So we're going to start with Rochester um, as, the, as the first one. And um, here's Rochester's total value map. 
and we we located the Walmart because it shows up uh, super valuable in total value and then dissipates in value per acre. And you can see that here in 3D and how flat the Walmart is versus the traditional core of, of the city. And we typically call the downtowns the mountain that pops up um, in the center. And we see that you'll see that pattern over and over again. And actually, if you look at the county, um, you'll see that in, in Durham, Dover, and Rochester, all of their downtowns pop up off the map. Um, at a countywide level, the county is about 5% of the area of the state. It's producing about 7% of the value of the state. That's a one to one and a half ratio of productivity, which is which is reasonable for the scale of a state. Um, your your Rochester is a municipality inside inside the county um, is about 12% of the county's area. It's about 19% of the county's value, which is also a one to 1.5. Um, the downtown is a piece of Rochester, the city. Yeah, it's about 1% of the area is producing 8% of the value, which is a 1 to 10 ratio of productivity. So the, we use these productivity ratios as sort of a benchmark. An average for a city is for its downtown over, over the city is about a 1 to 6. So this is punching above that benchmark, which is good. Um, but, but don't forget that the, the downtown produces county taxes, um, and it's barely showing up from the county's perspective. Uh, is producing, you know, 0.4 percent of the value. So when you do the math on that, that's a one to 16 ratio of productivity. That's really potent for the county. Um, and again, your county doesn't receive a lot of property taxes, but it's still receiving that potency out of the downtown. Now, Rod, the, the uh, Stratford County is about 16 percent non-taxable. Um, Rochester is about 7 percent non-taxable. Um, both of those numbers are a little a little low there it, it, this the county would matter from a state average standpoint so it's a little bit below state average um, and generally with with cities and towns we usually see them at around 20 percent um, non-taxable but it's again it's every place is going to be different depending on your choices that you make how much parks you have whether or not you have a, a, a school or a university um, now of the land use types the commodities that make up these models um, these are basically your ingredients. Your single family home, uh, generally coming in at the greenish range at about a point, let's call it half a million an acre for single family. Uh, when you get a multifamily, you're looking at uh, a little bit of almost double that. It, you know, we're ta talking about um, three quarters of a million for multifamily. Uh, commercial box, this is like a representative sample of the commercial box, it's about a million dollars uh, an, an acre of value and then when you get into your mixed use stuff now when you start to see a bump up to let's call it four million an acre um five million an acre and and we went ahead and this this model and this image are basically the same thing we did this for everybody some people some people could read a spatial model other people won't prefer a map um, so we put them on the map so you can see them and again you'll have these these samples for your community as far as productivity, this is like laying the city down sideways and looking at the mountain profile of it and seeing the tide mark for where the average of the whole city is and where do you find a uh, single family, uh, which is a little bit above average, uh, multi-family is above that. Uh, these are like the, uh, the the tide marks of each of each zone. This is the commercial area. Um, here's what mixed use marks at and then here's your peak. So that's for Rochester. As we move over to Dover, um, here's Dover's total value. Liberty Mutual is the big kahuna here um, in value, but then value per acre, it dissipates and flattens out a lot when you see it in the 3D. Um, you also can see how Dover's downtown pops up a lot higher and faster. Um, and you, you see it in the model when you look at them side by side. Uh, Dover does quite well uh, in, in its model. So again, as an area, we already did this. This is at the state level. Here's the county level for, for Dover. The city's about 6% uh, of the county's area. It's 27% of the value. It's a one to four ratio. So a little bit more potent than, um, than what we saw in Rochester. The downtown uh, to the city is 0.5% of the value. It's 4% of the, or it's 5.5% 5, 5 of the area, 4% of the value. That's a one to nine ratio, a little bit less than uh, what we saw in Rochester, and that's probably due to the fact that the housing is a little bit more value, so the lower bar of the tide comes up a little higher um, on the base of this model. 
but at a countywide level, it's three one thousandths of an of of a value um, for the for the area, um, and about one one hundredth of a percent of value. So it's a one to forty ratio of productivity. That's highly productive. And and again, this is a pattern that we see in a lot of places where the downtowns are super productive for counties. And and rarely do we bring counties into the conversation. And and we should. And I'm guilty as charged. When I was part of the downtown association here in Asheville, we made it a point to constantly talk with the county and make them part of the state of the downtown address or whatever, just so that we could maintain that relationship because far too often we don't do that. So uh, we already did Stratford County at 16% non-taxable, uh, Dover's 15% non-taxable. Um, and again, you see the larger tracts of the wildlife management areas uh, are, are the biggest contributors um, in, in, the, uh, in the area. So for its land, land use types, uh, here's single family um, at about 0.7, three quarters of a million. Uh, multifamily, now you're getting close to 2 million, which is a bigger bump for the multifamily here in Dover. Um, and then here's the commercial at about 1.3 less than multifamily. Um, here's mixed use at about, let's call it 10 million, and then um, maxing out at 15 million an acre. And again, here's, here's the map with those properties on it as well. So at the, at the title level, um, here's single family at 0.7, uh, a little bit below city average um, here on, on this one. And uh, commercial is a little bit above city average. Multifamily is above commercial. And here's mixed use and uh, peak. Um, so it's it's nice to see these tide marks and see how how they expand and go up as as the buildings mix it up, and you get that productivity in the downtown. Um, and uh, the next example is is Portsmouth, uh, which is it, it it turned out really cool to see this to see the city. I've I've visited Portsmouth several times. It's been great to see. Um, it's instant success with only 25 or 30 years of trying. Uh, it's come a long way, and um, you've done a lot of great work there. Uh, the Lanza property shows up as the top value when you look at the total value, but when you see value per acre, the Lanza dips down. Um, it actually does all okay for a large parcel, and it pops up a lot higher than what you saw with the, with the Liberty Mutual um, in the last model. But you really start to see the downtown take off in, in Portsmouth. Um, so Portsmouth's part of Rockingham County with, with that, with ex ex Exeter, um, and, uh, Rockingham County is about seven, let's call it 8% of the county's area, about 26% of the value. That's a one to four, one to 3.5 ratio of productivity. Um, this, this, the city of, of Portsmouth is about 3% of Rockingham County. It's about 12% of the value. That's a one to 4.4 value of city to county which is pretty good. Um, and the downtown to the city is 0.7% of the value. It's or the area, 10% of the value. That's a one to 16 ratio of productivity, which is exceptional. And again, remember I said one to six is average. So this is what three times, about three times average. Um, and so remember the downtown is also part of the county. So there are these numbers, um, which is just ridiculous at one to 70. Of ratio of productivity of taxes that the county gets is a ratio of productivity. So again, the county should be very proud of this, as well as the citizens of Portsmouth. Um, this is highly productive and a great yield return uh, to the county. From a taxable standpoint, um, you know, there are some missing data parcels here um, in the county, um, but again, it's not that significant because they're less habited. habit habituated or hab habitated areas, but about 20% non-taxable. At the city level, you're looking at 18%. And, and even though Portsmouth has um, the airport on its property consuming a lot of real estate. Um, land use types uh, going around the model. Uh, here's the housing, uh, the multifamily housing at double. Single family is much higher in Portsmouth at 2 million an acre. Again, Portsmouth is also a very small boundary, um, so it's 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 drilling in closer to a downtown area, which is probably driving those values up. Also, it's a very desirable place uh, to live. Obviously, um, commercial is higher than average at two million, um, and then mixed use is killing it at 29 million 
and peaking out at 51 million an acre. Um, and remember what we saw earlier was, was peaking out at 5 million. So it's a tremendous difference when you get into uh, downtown Portsmouth. Um, and again, here it is on the map with those properties. And uh, from a productivity standpoint of the tide marks, here's the uh, average uh, city value at half a million uh, value per acre. Um, single family is four times that at 2.1. Multifamily is uh, or commercial is a nudge above that at 2.3. Uh, multifamily is double single family at 5.7. Um, and then you get into the mixed use stuff at 29 and peaking it at 51. Um, this is by far the, the tallest spike in, in all of the sample sets. And we'll see that again when we get to a com comparison. Um, and finally, to close with Exeter. Um, the, the Exeter Hospital is, the, um, is, the, is showing up as the largest uh, parcel file. Um, and uh, here it is in total value per acre. And here it is in the model. Um, and rural downtown is actually um, stepping well above that um, in the model. Um, is, a, is a county level, um, you know, we've already done this, the county to the state. Here's, the, here's within Exeter within the county. And you can see that it's a lot flatter than what we saw in Portsmouth. It's 2% of the area, 4% of the value. Uh, it's about a 1 to 1.6 ratio of productivity. Uh, the downtown is a piece of the county, is 0.3% uh, of the area, about 3% 3 3 of the value. So that's a 1 to 10 ratio of productivity. That's, that's again, pretty good. 1 to 6 is, is average. Um, and then the downtown is a piece of the county, um, pretty insignificant from an area standpoint, uh, about, you know, let's call it 15 times the value productivity um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the punch of taxes to the county. Uh, taxable, non-taxable, again, as we saw in the Portsmouth, 20% non-taxable to the county. Um, and Exeter has one of the larger uh, non-taxable areas. Uh, some of this is the, is the academy. Um, but a lot of it, as you see, are the conservation areas uh, around the community. Now, what you'll see at every community, they're all, every community makes their own political decisions and, uh, and they all come with their own uh, consequences. So this is a choice of the community to take the land and to preserve, and that's fine. Um, that actually uh, works well for the community and, it's, and it, it gives the quality of life that they're looking for. So um, as far as land use types, uh, these are the different uh, samples around the community from housing, uh, multifamily, um, commercial, uh, much lower than, than what you saw in Portsmouth at under, under a million uh, an acre. Um, when you get into the mixed use in the downtown, just for a three-story building, you're getting about 8 million an acre and then peaking out at uh, 13 million. One of the things that's really nice about this as an example is notice those two buildings. I always tell people, don't believe your eyes until you see the data. That if you were to look at the building, uh, if you were to look at this building here, the, the, the Odd Fellows Hall, and you were to look at this building here, would you ever say that this building was more productive than that building? Probably wouldn't. You know, this building is much more stately. It's a much more grand building. But, you know, the proof, the proof is in the data when you run the numbers and that one pops up. So it is what it is. Um, so here they are um, on their map as well. So from a tidal standpoint, here's the city average, here's the single family average, here's the commercial average, and there's a big step up to the multifamily average, um, almost doubling single family, and here's uh, mixed use, and then the peak, uh, peak of all of, of, of Exeter. So I mentioned that we did a comparison. We ran through these in the last uh, presentation. I'm gonna run through them again. This is all of the sample of all of the different communities. So we're gonna go through, um, bar charts are kind of hard to read in a PowerPoint. So what's more important to see is the trend line and how it moves, but it's, it's also in the comparison of different data points. So these are just, how do you answer questions and how does everybody stack up? So if we just say population, here's how everybody stacks up from a population standpoint. And there's a big step up from, 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 uh, from Concord to, to Nashua uh, in population. When you get into area, um, these are everybody's areas, and you see how small Portsmouth is at the far left at about 10,000, um, 10, let's, call let's call it 11,000 acres 
versus Concord at, at 38,000. Um, a tremendous, a very large difference in city size, but that's all kind of arbitrary. It's all, city sizes are all created in the past in most cases, um, particularly in New England where you have towns butting up against each other. Um, so there's not really a rule there, but this helps with, with understanding density. Um, and this is the density. When you divide population in the area, Peterborough is the least dense. Um, you know, you can see Rochester in the middle of the pack here, um, and Dover at, you know, about double uh, Rochester, and then Portsmouth is at, at 2.5, then a big jump up to Nashua and Manchester, obviously, as the most dense. From an average population standpoint, if you're to group them, um, you know, these may be the groupings that you could see um, from a peer sample. But even within that, the average of the of the city size from Rochester to Manchester, there still is a pretty big jump from Concord to Nashua. Um, from a taxable to non-taxable standpoint, this is how everybody's areas stack up of who's got what kind of taxable, non-taxable. Um, is, is a gross in in um, in value. Um, it's probably not a fair way to look at this way. The the better way to look at it is if you're to set everybody at 100% of area, who's got how much area off the rolls for non-taxable. And I, I put in the state average at 19% there is kind of a limbo bar. And right out the door, you see the second one from the left, uh, Berlin. Uh, you can see how much non-taxable, and that's mostly due to one large state park with Jericho Mountain in it. So if you were to just remove that park and say, okay, let's just remove that area because it's a big state park. Um, once you do that, then you see that, that Berlin is actually um, very comparable to everybody else, but you see where Exeter um, and uh, Concord have more non-taxable. Concord you'd expect because it's a state capital um, and that's typical what we see at state capitals, a lot more land taken off the tax rolls for obvious government purposes. Um, and it is what it is, not that bad, uh, really at, at about 20, let's call it 28% uh, non-taxable. Um, from a valuation perspective, these are everybody's values. So you can see the the, the least valuable uh, community is still pulling about $800 million of taxable value at Claremont um, over here. Um, when you get into Dover is pulling $3.4 billion of taxable value, so as a corporation, Dover's a $3.4 billion corporation. Um, so I can move this out of the way. Portsmouth, oops. Portsmouth is uh, 5.3, let's call it $5.4 billion in uh, value. Uh, just by comparison, the New York Yankees are about a million dollars. Boston's, the, the Boston Red Sox are, are, are less than the Yankees in value. But um, so you got, uh, I think, the, I think the, the Red Sox are about 900, 900 million. So you could buy like about six socks uh, if you want to liquidate Portsmouth. Um, and Rochester's at 2.6 uh, billion and Exeter's you know, not so bad at 1.7 billion. So these are tremendous values. Um, from an average value per acre standpoint, these are the average, this, this is the, your, your real estate potency um, in each community. And you really start to see how Portsmouth shines uh, uh, as second from the, from the right. And then there's a big step down to Dover, Exeter, and Hanover. Um, or Rochester is over here at 88,000. Um, Exeter is just behind um, Dover at about, a, let's call it 200,000 an acre of value. Um, so when you stack up your densities and your value, on the left is your people per, is there a relationship of density to value? Is it if you, if you, um, have a high density, is it, is it creating value? Um, on the right, we have Portsmouth. Um, sorry, I need to move this out of the way. Coming in at about 500 and, let's call it 560,000 an acre of value for average value. And then you see on, on, the, on the left over here that it has a much lower density of people per acre than, than Nashua. So it isn't necessarily true a truism to say that density correlates with value. Where you can see on the right, you can see how you know, Nashua is like almost three times the density, um, but it's not as valuable as, as Portsmouth. And that's because Portsmouth has a really strong 
character of downtown and that value in the architecture in it in its downtown. There may be dense parts to Portsmouth, but it's the value of the architecture that that, that really brings it. Um, the the other thing that was interesting is is Hanover um, as in a, a, like an exurb of or sorry not Hanover Le Lebanon as a Han as a as a as a neighbor to Hanover coming in at about the same value, but um, when you look at the the density, Hanover is a lot less dense than than Lebanon, um, about you know a, a third less dense. So again, the density and valuation is just do the numbers, understand the place, but really what it has to do with is the architecture and the stacking. So back to this chart that I did for our entire data sample of, of all of our portfolio, this is this is y'all uh, in, in your state and how you guys are working out right now that you see uh, taking your numbers, your city single family is about 680,000 an acre, your commercial boxes are about a little over a million and then your city multifamily is 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 doubling more than doubling it's about almost three times uh, single family and then here's a, the average mixed use and then the peak values at 16 million so these are all, all really really impressive um, another way to look at them outside of bar charts is just stack up the community so we've made a series of these samples we'll give you all the data so that you can you know compare whoever you want but um Basically looking at Rochester, Dover, and Portsmouth is your first set of Seacoast group. Um, you're looking at the um, population sizes. Actually, Portsmouth is, a, is the smallest uh, of the set um, with a much higher uh, peak value than, than everybody um, and as well a higher average value, uh, double the average value of Dover. Um, and uh, I guess it would be like five times or four times the, uh, the, the, the height of the peak. Um, for for Exeter, we put Exeter in a, a kind of like an academic uh, town peer set. It's not it's not on the coast. It's not um, at, at that level of of develop. It has more of, of a relationship of an economic relationship to um, the academy, which functions more like a college or or, or a university. Um, but again, the population size is somewhere between Keene and Hanover. Um, the taxable uh, the non-taxable aspect of it. These are. It's really important to use this as a bar as a barometer for any kind of academic community. Um, but these aren't so bad. 30% um, still not bad uh, from it. From you. here in Asheville, we have University of North Carolina at Asheville. Our community is 30% non-taxable. So we're about what Exeter is. Um, the average value per acre, Exeter is actually doing quite well. So actually, part of that taking that land off the tax rolls makes the other land uh, more valuable because of scarcity, essentially. Um, it drives up that value. Um, but you also see that in the peak value um, is doing, they're doing well for all these communities under 25,000 people. They're, that's very, high, very, very impressive, uh, particularly Hanover at, at 38 million an acre of value for its peak and its downtown. Uh, just so that we have, we have these other groups, I'm just gonna go ahead and show them to you. These are the, uh, um, places without really a functional core. There's not really a, a, a there there. It's a, there's a lot of housing, but not really a downtown in the in the Hudson, Pelham, and, and Laconia group. Um, but that also means it's an opportunity to grow it. Um, there's the ones that do have strong downtowns, but they aren't necessarily um, at a booming level the way that you're doing on the seacoast or in the um, in the main corridor. But um, these are uh, uh, Claremont, Lebanon, Peterborough, and, and Berlin. Um, in a, smaller places, um, much smaller peaks. At the top one is only 14 million in, in Lebanon. Um, but what's interesting is, is Lebanon's average value is is quite exceptional at, at 90 90,000 an acre in this peer set. Um, and then finally, the, the 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 large places: Concord, Manchester, New York, Nashua. Uh, these are all again very impressive places. Um, Significant populations, although you know Manchester is by far uh, the bigger population. Um, the average value are, is is very high in Manchester, uh, but Nashua is not so bad. But where you see Nashua suffer is in the peak. Um, they just again that's an opportunity to build that up, and they've got peer samples to show. So just to close with some lessons, um, we see this in lots of cities. 
old cities have really impressive stuff. And Charleston is like the Boston of the South. We did Charles Charleston and we were doing it. We're like, look, you can't claim the ocean ocean value and the beachfront value. So we're going to wipe out the ocean. This is what humans created. And you could see the old peninsula, very much like the Boston Peninsula, um, popping up for its downtown. And Charleston predates the Declaration of Independence. So we have a birth date. So we grabbed all the colonial buildings in Charleston. This is the Red Dot Liquor Store. It's the oldest, um, the oldest liquor store in the entire country, uh, built in 1686. This is a revolutionary getting his drink on. Um, but here are all the buildings that predate the United States. Here are the Iron Plan. So they, they have 21 acres of pre-colonial buildings or the colonial buildings that survived 240 years somehow in, a, in their community. This is what they paid in county taxes in 2015 when we did this analysis. Now, by comparison, uh, there's a Walmart that's 21 acres. Uh, this is what it paid the same year. So these are choices. Um, you know, surely you can't have all that commerce going on inside a, a colonial building. It's a different architectural type. But when you have a building that's designed to fail in 20 years, that's a choice. And you see that in the numbers. It's depreciating as fast as possible, where those colonial buildings weren't designed that way. Um, so this is just something to bear in mind that for, for 240 years, these things have produced 13 times a Walmart. Think of the intergenerational wealth that, they, that Charleston has gained off those buildings. And you, and you all have that in spades all around you. These buildings are averaging $8 million an acre. Many of these buildings have been around for about 100 years or more. So this is, they just repurpose themselves. There's a value to this. There's also a value of understanding urban design. Um, this is a, a, a sample project that we did in Derry um, to analyze a, a, a development just outside of the city. Um, core area right about here. There's two developments side by side. Um, one on this side of the street where number one is and then another one in the number two is over here. So I'm just gonna go through, they're currently going through a design process and I just wanna talk about how would I evaluate design and what does it mean when you look at, at parcels? Um, there's a, a friend of mine, Jeff Speck, who um, who's sent me his plan that he was doing for this side of the street. Uh, Jeff's trained as an urban designer. This is kind of how an urban designer would approach a site. So he's essentially building a New Englandy mixed-use village uh, as a design on, on one side of the street um, that has this kind of villagey feel. And here's the street plan um, in the lower right. Um, across the street is this development. So this again, these are both con let's call them conceptual drawings. Right now, they're going through a, a planning process. Uh, when I see drawings like this, the first thing that my mind does is it turns things into parking and building because that's basically what drives value, either up or down. And so when you color in the parking and the buildings on one side of the street, you see this form. And when you do it on that side of the street, you see this. So these are choices. Um, one of the things that happens is there's a shape of the streets that happens. So you can see how this is, takes an internal street structure and makes a very craggly kind of cow path shape to it, which is very New Englandy. Um, this is just basically bars of buildings floating in fields of parking. Now, one of the things that happens is what the street feel is. On one side, you have a street wall that contains the, the buildings, contain the street, which is very New England. The buildings step up to the street. On the other side is very post-war suburban where the buildings step back. Um, when we talk about urbanism and suburb suburbanism, uh, there's a lot of language that maybe we need to talk about more directly when we do analysis, which is what happens to the speed of cars when buildings step back. There's data around that. People drive faster. It becomes more dangerous for pedestrians. Um, it also distorts valuation in the property. So this is the second street that steps back as well. So when you look at this, um, from a ratio of building to parking, this side of the street is about a 1 to 1.5. And once you cross the street, it almost doubles to 1 to 2.8 from a ratio of building to parking. Now, the reason why this is important, we did this analysis in Manchester. And I would recommend you all to do this. They, they complained about parking in the downtown. It's difficult to park. And so we just basically mapped it. And within a, a five-minute walk, of um, of the, uh, the, the the factory buildings, there's a tremendous amount of parking within a five minute walk, and all the white arrows are parking structures that are either within a five or six minute walk 
to the to the to the loft. So it's there's perception and reality. When you look at the whole city, this is how the the city is used. These are all the buildings if you put them side by side. These this is the parking. These are the roads. This is everything else. We don't use a whole lot of our real estate for buildings at the end of the day. Um, but there's a there's a net effect. So these are the numbers in 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 Manchester. That's the average Manchester resident. There she is. She's got about a thousand square feet of building and about one and a half parking spaces dedicated to her across the entire city. When this gets built, it gets valued. So this is the value of a per square foot of building, and this is parking. This is a parking lot in the middle of downtown. So this is the best priced parking lot we could find, only pulling a dollar twenty in value. Now remember, when you build a street, that street's going to cost you twenty dollars a square foot in front of the building and in front of the parking. So this is paying 75 times more taxes than that. It's right there in the numbers. This is this is 75 times more taxes than that from a value standpoint, yet your cost is the same. So that is a subsidy. Parking is subsidized. If you tax it less, that's a subsidy. So there's a value effect in transference. So back to that drawing, um, you know, I would I would seriously, if I was going through a planning process, I would consider the economic effect of you're getting double the value out of this on this side of the street versus that side of the street. And that's a reality to it. So these are trade-offs. Um, there's choices and consequences. Um, when you look at it in the drawing, I just went ahead and just said, all right, well, the parking starts pretty much at the middle, the, the, the door right here. Um, it goes to pretty much the middle of this building right there. Um, and the parking is a field. You can see the width of that parking is about the width of this building right here. So we can just go right on this drawing and then it doubles back here. Let's just go ahead and draw it on the drawing. That's that's one parking field. Here's the second one and here's the third one. So when we do analysis, this is this should be part of every process. You just run the numbers, make sure these costs are are, are conscious and choices. You may want to do one of these or two of them, but if, if you start building your city in this way, you're essentially driving down the value of your place. So also measure what you're carrying. Uh, if those are revenues, what about costs? So in Lancaster, California, we measured, uh, they're, they're up and over the mountain from Los Angeles. They're about 160,000 people. Here's their city. Um, they don't have a great downtown. But what was scary was how many miles of roads they had. They had 953 miles of roads. I don't know what that looks like, so we put it on a map. So they have enough roads to go from Los Angeles to Portland. When you build roads, you're stuck with them forever. You have to plow them. You have to pothole them, you have to fix them, you have to pave them. Every 50 years you have to rebuild them. So here are all their roads when they built them. We put them on a little timeline. They had a little building spree in the early 1900s. Everybody went to sleep. And then you see in 1953, they built a lot of roads in 1953. Well, guess what? That comes back to haunt your parents' generation um, in 1983. And then what did they do? Well, they let out more development. They got more roads. Um, so this comes back with the first, with the second rebuild and brings along with it the new stuff. So we stopped them in 2016 and said, you're not going to build another road. We're just going to see how your, how your carrying costs look over time. And this is what it looks like. In every community, this is what's happening. We have built way too many roads post-World War II. And as we, we, you know, we bought into a car culture. It's like, that's great. But what's the, what's the cost of buying into that? So that first wave was just kind of crazy. And then we went ahead and doubled down on that because we convinced ourselves this is who we are. But but now for our generation, notice how it's getting bigger and bigger and we're doing nothing to it. Remember, I didn't add any more roads to this and it's capitalizing on itself. That's the cost of asphalt. That's the cost of construction. Everything's going up and it's not getting cheaper to hold on to asphalt. So when you take their budget and their money and flush it into the system, they can only afford what's in green. We just flushed it into the map to show them um, starting in the center of downtown and working your way out. And this isn't to say that cut off all the roads in red, but they need to realize they can only afford 50%. And if you, you know, if you think, okay, Joe, that's a Sunbelt problem. All right, let's talk about Manchester. Manchester in 1925 had 77,000 people, 140 miles of roads, and nine, about 9.6 feet of road per person. After that period, after 1925, they grew to 111,000 people. They grew their roads to 535 miles, up to about 25 feet of road per person. So they've just more than doubled their feet of road per person. So their population went up 44%. Their consumption of infrastructure went up 163%. And 
And, and this isn't just Manchester. Every community we go to, we see this. And it's just like, again, put it on a map, take a look at it. These are choices you've made. Just be aware that the stuff doesn't disappear. So what do we do? Um, one is do more analytics. Uh, this is a sample set that we've given you. Keep going. Um, when, we, when we typically work with a community, we'll dig deeper into even just the dirt. So this is the dirt analysis in Cheyenne, Wyoming. There are no buildings in this picture. And one of the great things about this is this, you can see how assessment works a lot cleaner this way because there's no buildings. And you expect the world to, everybody in this neighborhood is the same value per acre, they're all blue. When I was presenting this in Cheyenne, Wyoming, I said, hey, what's going on here where this is blue and that's orange? So it goes from 15,000 to 40,000 an acre just by crossing the street, same zoning category. And as I was presenting this, the assessor raised her hand and she just belted out. She's like, you don't understand, this is lower value because it's a bigger parcel. The bigger the parcel, the lower the value per acre. Let that wash over you for a second. The mayor started laughing so hard he almost spat coffee out of his nose. And I was like, really? So I get more of your stuff and you charge me less for it. She goes, well, that's our standard. I said, okay, well, I've got three miles of infrastructure around this property. This fellow's only got 200 feet. She goes, yeah, we don't count infrastructure as part of the valuation. I said, so I can get a bigger property. You can give me more infrastructure. You give me more of your stuff and you charge me less for it. She goes, yeah, that's our standard. So I went to the assessors conference. And again, don't fault the assessors. I went to their conference and I asked them, uh, they, by the way, their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. I said, so how is this fair and how is this equitable? And to their credit, they're like, it's not. I'm like, where did this standard come from? Did Moses deliver this to you? Can you change it? Like, can you see how this will affect the market? that if you discount something, I'm gonna take more of it. And they're like, yeah, that's a good point. We probably need to change that. You need to talk to Larry. So they sent me to this guy, Larry Clark. I talked to Larry, Larry's awesome. He's like, yeah, we probably need to change that. It'll just take a while to get through the system. Now, remember, these are humans doing their best to be fair and equitable, and they're honest about it. So just look at your data. This is the dirt value per acre uh, of Charleston and, uh, I'm sorry, Manchester in, in Nashua. So we have this for, for Hillsborough County. But you can see how um, some of the smaller parcels are higher potency than the larger parcels behind them. And that's a truism because of the standard. Um, you also want to look for uh, you know, things like this where you have outliers. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can adjust the valuation. You can use this as a device to do better assessment um, as, a, as, a, as a visual aid, um, if you will. Um, also learn from your neighbors. You have this incredible data set now or you can do peer sampling and stack yourself up against other places. You can see who's really crushing it and go and talk to them and figure out what you can do to steal from them and learn from these examples. These are all, transfer it's all transferable data. And, and you know a lot of this stuff. Uh, maintaining and recreating your historic value is super important. And this is a, a postcard from 1905 um, in, in, in Portsmouth. And that block today is pulling 40 million, 35 million, 30 million an acre. I mean, incredible values. And it's done that for over 100 years. And so you can see this happening. This is a new building. By the way, this, this, we couldn't find the value of this. I would urge people in Portsmouth to collect the condo data of this. It was difficult for us to do that. Um, and it might be just that it's just still too new. But, but this will be incredible. And you can see that because it's mimicking its neighbor at, 30 million. Adapt the buildings. You know this. This is again a not a not not a a a, 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 a big uh, change for you all. You're already doing this. These buildings weren't designed for their original use. That you've used this architecture over and over. You've recycled these buildings. Really amazing to do that. Um, realize that parking is subsidized. Rethink parking standards. Do you even need them? Um, you know, it's like or think about if we're if we're taking on the car when it moves around on the street, maybe we should start thinking about the infrastructures of cars when they stop, you know, and, and see that as part of the infrastructure. But don't don't just casually subsidize it this way and think that there isn't a economic effect. So build for productivity. Um, this is the average of the sample of commercial properties of less than a million across the sample. When you get into your mixed use stuff at three stories, um, you're talking 8 million. So go from a million to 8 million. That's a pretty big bump. And you all have these examples all around. Um, patterns have costs. Um, and this is an example I didn't show at the last one, but I'm going to show it here. 
when, when, when somebody owns an asset, like let's say I'm a real estate developer and I own this mall over here. I know that when I own that mall, I have air conditioners that need to be fixed or replaced um, every, every so often. And those air conditioners are gonna cost me $85,000 a pop. Um, I'm also gonna need a, a, a helicopter crew uh, to, to, to sky crane them in at 35,000. So every 15 to 20 years, I need to spend about $205,000. That's how you're stuck with infrastructure. There's a cost to that infrastructure. We actually call it an asset in our budgets. It's not really an asset, it's a liability. This is a perpetual thing that you need to fund. You need money to come out of those buildings. And the more that you stack those dollars on a single piece of infrastructure, it's highly, highly efficient. And you have these examples, and you also have these kinds of examples where you have really expensive infrastructure with not a lot of value that comes out of it. So design affects valuation and cash flow. So I'll give you one quick example. This is South Bend, Indiana. These are 88 houses as a grid in 88, 88 houses in a cul-de-sac. It's actually a cul-de-sac of cul-de-sacs. It's kind of a, the mother of all cul-de-sacs. But um, these are 88 houses. So we measured the roads, the annual cost of roads, pipes, storm sewers, and um, a total of about 122,000. Taking 10% of their revenue, you're looking at about $21,000. So right out the door, you can see it's subsidized at $100,000 a year um, for their single family residential pattern at 88 houses. And this is this is not new information. Residential single family is subsidized, period. Um, 88 houses in a grid pattern, here they are. Um, here are their numbers. I'm gonna come back to all this. So there are their numbers, there's their stack. So here they are side by side. Um, so you can see that the residential and the grid pattern is a subsidy of 57,000, let's call it 60,000 while the 88 houses in this pattern is about 100,000. So it's about almost two times the subsidy to do this pattern. When people say, well, Joe, I wanna live in a cul-de-sac, I don't want traffic, it's like, yeah, great. You're also getting a huge subsidy, so of course you want it. So, so just write that down and make sure that you can afford that. You have to send a plow into that cul-de-sac and it's gotta circle around and come back out. So you're, you're paying those costs. Measure what you own measure the streets, be aware of the ongoing costs of that, do what we did in Manchester and replicate it. Um, and also finally, since this is a state model, I wanna close with this. Um, consider your tax system. You know, y'all should at least allow, have your state give you the enabling legislation to do different kinds of taxation at a local level. So one of the taxes I would talk about is the, the Henry George land value tax. This was a a tax that was proposed in the, the 18, 19, or sorry, the 1800s. Henry George thought it was patently unfair that you could just step off the Mayflower and be the Copleys in Boston and just hold on to real estate forever and do nothing. Meanwhile, the whole community has put infrastructure in the roads and the pipes and everything else. And because you chose to use the land as vacant, you're paying no taxes. He's like, there should be at least be a baseline tax for everybody. And, and that would actually encourage people to stimulate the market because you won't hang on your land forever and make everybody else pay for your growth and value. So what ends up happening is people, they'll either pay you a higher tax or they'll put it into the market, which will drive down the cost of land. It's an incredibly uh, egalitarian way to deal with it. It actually became a huge movement in the 1800s called Georgism. Um, you know, a lot of people like I, Joe, I've never heard of Georgism. It's like, well, Elizabeth Maggie Phillips was a Georgist. She's got spectacular eyebrows, but um, she thought, well, I'm not gonna deal with, with adults because adults, it's too hard for them to change the tax system. I'll work with kids. So she invented a board game called what we call Monopoly now. That's basically land value taxation. So we all learn this as kids, just apply it to your cities. But I think, you know, I'm not saying go do it, but at least have your state enable that through your legislation so you could do it if you want, like, why not? It's your community. So we always advocate, we're like accountants, just put the stuff on a map so people can see it and communicate it and make choices. Your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? Your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. You can go ahead and do a, 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 a strip mall or subdivision that doesn't work, fine. As long as you're writing that down and you can afford it, go for it. But don't do a lot of your portfolio that way and think that you can build your way out of it. It just doesn't work. So put the numbers on a map so people can see it. Uh, we're big, huge fans of Chuck Marone and Strong Towns. 
I recommend following his blog, read his book, uh, give his book to, to all of your planning commissioners and city councilors. It's a, it's a great lesson on how cities work and do your math. So thank you for your time. Um, I know this has been a long show and a long presentation, and I wanna thank you for giving us the ability to do this. There'll be other sections uh, that we'll be going through. If you wanna join those other presentations, feel free. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back over to, um, who am I turning this back over to for questions? Thanks, Joe, that was really great. Um, we do have lots of questions for you. Okay. Uh, we also have, thanks to, there was a Portsmouth planner in the, in attendance tonight that answers your question about that mixed use building on State Street in Portsmouth, which has 10 units and ground floor commercial and aggregate value of close to 80 million per acre. Wow. So that was an answer from our, our planner. Thanks, Nick. Hey, Nick, I'm going to grab, there's a mic drop. Bam, there it goes. <laughs> Um, so we have some great questions for you. I'm going to start with, does optimizing tax revenue, which in New Hampshire means property taxes, set the stage for a less diverse population? No. Um, I mean, it, it's a... Uh, um... God, I, I, I have a presentation that I could make about that we've done with poor African-American communities in South Florida uh, paying more taxes than Mar-a-Lago. Um, but I can send you a video link to that. The short answer is no. Um, there, there are, I would say when you, when you investigate the, the tax system, you'll actually find that some of your, um, what we, we would consider less well-off uh, communities are actually quite, quite productive uh, from a tax standpoint. Um, it's not necessarily about optimization. It's about being conscious to the cash flow and making, you know, you're going you're gonna to subsidize something. The, the, the market will not just out of its good graces produce affordable housing if somebody will pay more for that same unit. Like, why would you? As a private individual, you'd be kind of insane to do that. Now, some people may say, like, I, I, I have a, a duplex. I, I rent out my other unit at an incredible steal because that's who I am and I want to have a cool tenant and give somebody an opportunity to live live close to downtown. I don't need it. Um, but, you know, you don't have to, like there's, you're going to have to stimulate somehow. Um, you just want to be efficient and don't just bleed your money all over the place. It would be my lesson. Does that make sense? It's not to just build everywhere and just make, lots of times people are like, you want to see skyscrapers? It's like, you do notice I, I never showed a skyscraper in this entire presentation. They're just two and three story buildings. Um, I know another question that you get a lot and this came up in the chat tonight was about green space. And I know that you get this question every single time you do this presentation because I was on a webinar with you with uh, Strong Towns <laughs> earlier this year. So what does this mean for green space, which is something that we value a lot in New Hampshire? Yeah, there's, um, you know, I have that flippant comment when I show Asheville and I'm like, those are two big federal parks. They don't pay taxes. I don't care about it. I wouldn't live in Asheville if we didn't have those parks. I'm an avid mountain biker. Um, they make my quality of life. I just don't live in them. You know, it's like I'll go out and visit them when I want to. And I want to keep that land off the tax rolls and keep us constrained in. It's much better for the environment. So I would say by all means, connect your parks, make greenways, do that because you only have one chance to do that. Once somebody buys it and puts a house in it, it's gone. You know, you can't, you can't farm it, you can't do anything, it's gone. And, and I think that's with climate change, with, with, with the changes in the environment that we've all seen in our lifetimes, anybody over the age of, anybody that's paying attention has watched forests come down, they've seen the change of the landscape. And it's all due to the fact that we don't constrain the environment or the cash flow. I can go live way outside of town and drive in and then I get to drop all my expenses on your community and pay taxes somewhere else, you know? So it just, that's the 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 the, the loose economics of cities. Um, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I would just, you don't need to have a forest in the middle of your downtown, however. You can have a square and a plaza. There's, the green space could, could be different based on its topography and where it's at in the, the, the there's a lesson of the transect. Um, it actually comes from the study of natural environments that the new urbanists have sort of co-opted. Um, 
out at the edge of town, big, huge parks, make them all day long. As you start to move into neighborhoods, you should have neighborhood and smaller parks. And as you get into the downtown, it should be a square or a common. Um, so I would say do it. And, and oftentimes what we see is that value. Think about, think, about, uh, think about Central Park. The value in Park Avenue at the edge of the park is incredibly valuable. So it's not that the park doesn't remove the value, it just pushes it to the side. The same way that a, you, you experience on the ocean. Oceanfront real estate is going to be an incredible value until it floods. But um, <laughs> other than that, we'll deep um, It'd be weird if we didn't mention the coronavirus tonight. And so luckily a question just came in from somebody. Do you have any specific suggestions? They asked for Portsmouth, but I would say for all of us in light of the current COVID crisis, and I might editorialize and add, particularly because there is so much fear about density. Let's see. Am I still sharing? Yes. Um, I, I didn't want to go into PowerPoint DJ mode, but I guess you're going to make me now because um, I actually have a COVID presentation. It's going to be really quick. Um, so early on um, in this whole COVID thing, um, I did a I did a Strong Towns webinar, um, and everybody is freaked out about COVID. I was freaked out about it. I mean, how many of us lived in the pandemic? Um, but, you know, think about it from a standpoint of human history. Did, did Paris not have a, a pandemic before in its life ever? How about Rome or, or London? Um, so when you look at these places, they've always come back. Um, so that question came up. People were freaked out. They're like, what about COVID? What do we do? Does density spread COVID? And this is back in, um, what is this? This is March 27th. The New York Times finally did an article that gave us some understanding. They published this data. And I don't know if you all, we, we all remember when everybody's freaking out about Milan. Um, so here's Milan and Lombard, Lombardy. Um, and of course, New York Times being New York Times are very New York centric. They're like, oh, we care about ourselves. Um, and it's just, you know, they're, they're not as bad as Milan. But when you look at this data, you're like, hey, wait a second here. These are the cases per thousand, right? Um, here's Albany, Georgia. Why are we not hearing about Albany, Georgia is some sort of crisis zone? It's almost as bad as New York. So this is just cases per thousand. You've got population. So if we just add one more factor, which is area, we can do density analysis. So I was like, well, the New York Times is pretty lazy. So let's just go ahead and expand their table. So we just expanded their table to include the area. And you can see here that these are the cases per 100,000 per square mile. And there's New York at 0.61, right? Well, check this out. There's uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Pittsfield, Massachusetts had as many cases by density as New York City. Did you ever see a news article about the rash of COVID going on in Pittsfield, Massachusetts? Like, what's up with that? Or what's worse is East Stroudsburg, uh, Pennsylvania is even worse. So, so, of course, we're graphic people. We made a graphic. This is the density of, of New York, and these are all the other places from a comparative density standpoint. Um, this is the cases of density. So if you look over, bring that back in, here's Pittsfield's density. So Pittsfield is about 1 40th the density of New York, yet it's got an equal size cases as New York. So there's no correlation between density and you know, our built environment. It, it, it's, it's wear a mask, don't sneeze on somebody, and make sure you take care of yourself. It's not, it's, it's, you can handle this. Wuhan has beat the COVID virus. Wuhan is, is denser than anything that, that New Hampshire could imagine. And yet they're fine now. So I don't know. It's just, what, we, what I found is a lot of people, and the, the, the home builders capitalized on this. They released a bunch of articles selling single family detached houses in the middle of nowhere. They're like, escape the city. I mean, you're still working in the city. You're still around other people. Um, but anyway, so no. So the person who asked that question expanded on a little bit, and it's actually related to another question that came in earlier about 
Portsmouth being a destination for bigger city folks because they feel they have the density right or close to right in the in the current times. How much bigger should Portsmouth consider going because of the the city's tourist appeal? And there was another question earlier about the tipping point. At what point do you reach that tipping point where the type of development or the amount of development starts to erode the sort of the charm and the value of that city? Is Paris not charming? Um, I don't. Do people still go to Paris, or is it overbuilt? Um, you know, it's that's a it's it's such a quantitative or a qualitative. Kind of, will, will Portsmouth change? I mean, I, I remember going to Portsmouth in the '90s when it was good and dumpy, and uh, there was just like some scraggly bars with some drunks like in that. We used to go up there from when I was in grad school, but it's like. It's changed a lot since that time. Asheville has changed. We've got the same tourist problem here in Asheville. In fact, we've gone full Monty and put on a, a, a hotel moratorium to keep hotels from coming to Asheville. Um, now, I, I, want to, I want to preface this with the name of our baseball team is called the Asheville Tourists. Tourism is our economy, yet we passed a moratorium against hotels. Unbelievably stupid. Um, it's not going to make the hotels disappear if we just kind of hold our breath. They're going to just wait and keep out. They're going to keep coming or worse. They're just going to go out into the county and and make us sprawl even more. The, the lesson of cities and places is if it's working, do more of it. Um, if you, you know, it's Port, Portland, Oregon has, has been a, an incredible example of this that, you know, they they if you talk to people in Portland, Oregon, they're just like our downtown is is we've just given it to the tourists. Um, although there's, it's still their commerce hub. They still have all their jobs there, but the neighborhoods have become more, have become more urbane. Inside the neighborhoods, they have restaurants and bars and record stores and, and the stuff that they like to go to. It's, it's still, they still retain their feel by deliberate action, but they allowed their neighborhoods to adapt and grow. Again, it's all scalable, right? So it's, it's if, if your downtown is getting too hot for you, how do you? How do you make those other spaces evolve to capture that feel? Can you know if if Portsmouth put Portsmouth, you know, in Asheville, I was uh, at this neighborhood association meeting. I was president of the group, and we were holding a meeting to remove the N from NIMBY and just have a conversation in our community about can we be proactive and say what makes us special, and and can we make more of it? How do we how do we be a, a, a the coolest city in the South? with a million people. Let's just stretch our brains out a little bit. And what does that look like? Can we do it? And instead the reaction was, I kid you not, she stood up and she was so mad at me. And she goes, no, we need to stop people moving here. And I said, ma'am, when did you move here? She goes, six months ago. And I said, okay, let's the two of us show some leadership. We'll both move to Atlanta, to, to Alabama or something. And she goes, no, 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 I want it here. And I'm like, was there a door that shut behind you? You know, if you're a Native American and you, ha you have that wish that you don't want anybody else here, Fine, I'll buy that. But for a an Anglo person or a an immigrant from Europe that came to the states to say all of a sudden this is my special place, that's not fair. I hope I wasn't too hostile about that. It's just cities and towns have to adapt. But seriously, it's like if you know it's working, make more of it. Make more of what's working. I think we can squeeze in one more question. Uh, so this person asks, call it a myth or a reality, but it's a commonly held belief that communities need to have lower taxes in order to incentivize development. So how do communities in New Hampshire that are struggling to keep their taxes low increase valuation and in property in property, I assume property development, keeping in mind in New Hampshire, oftentimes low property evaluation communities. Yeah, there's, um, I'll pull up this slide. This is, this is something we did in um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, these are the, the sticker prices of uh, residential, low density and medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium, high, commercial, low, medium, and high. And we just gave them the sticker price. We're like, look, your single family is subsidized to the tune at about $1,400 an acre for that housing type, which is fine. You know, you make sure you write that down, but you certainly shouldn't have 80% of your land use in, in this subsidy. That's not a recipe for disaster. So the analogy that I used, um, we, were, we were having a meeting and I said, well, look, well, this meeting's got to end because I need to have, it's it's six o'clock and I need to go on my mountain bike ride because I've got a rule. I, I ate a cheeseburger today 
And when I eat a cheeseburger, I have to go out and mountain bike and then eat a salad. This is how I keep my diet in balance. And they're like, oh, please use this in the PowerPoints. I did. But um, think about the city the same way. You have all these transects of your city and you shouldn't have any one of these tree rings being a disproportionate sample. So you have to balance it out. So, um, you know, it, if, if you're consciously acting to grow some stuff that isn't in subsidy, you'll have more wealth to lower taxes because right now you're paying for subsidies. You know, so when people say we're out of money, it's like, well, you're not out of money. You've just allocated it in other places where, you know, every, I, I want you all to do this. Every time you drive by a vacant parking lot, when, when you're like going to the grocery store or going wherever, that is money you're burning because that road is not being paid for by that parking lot. So just, just be, and then when you complain, like there, there isn't enough parking or we need to force them to put more parking. It's like, all right, well, you just, you just wrote a check. So if, if we start telling all of these checks that we write, we'll start to see how much money we've burned just because we're, we're not looking at the numbers. So I would say, look, write it all down and then make better choices. Or if that's if that's what you want to do, if you want to subsidize parking and subsidize low land use and all, go for it. But just make sure you're writing all that down. Um, I would choose to spend on, even though I don't have kids, I would put the money toward education, towards parks and greenways, things that make us more healthy. I would subsidize artists because that makes things cool. You know, be somebody to pe build sculptures everywhere. I mean, that's what I would do. Um, make a great place. Awesome. Joe, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending and for your awesome questions. I wish we had time to get to all of them. We'll be sending out an email tomorrow that includes links to a video recording of this webinar tonight. So you can watch it again if you want, or you can send it to somebody who you think should see it. Uh, we'll also be sending a link to the PowerPoint presentation and an email survey. We appreciate it if you can fill that out. And as Joe mentioned, there will be regional presentations in the other regions too. And so if you wanna check any of those out in the Southern tier, Monadnock region, Upper Valley, um, you can check those out and you can find information about that too at nhhfa.org slash events. That's New Hampshire Housing's website. Thank you again for attending today's presentation. Thank you all.